Thank you so much. Um, so whoever has this uh, orange box, um, they need to throw it to the person who raises their hand. So you're, you're in charge of it as long as it's near you. Um, I don't want to be doing the throwing. Um, that's, that's the only thing. So, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've come here a couple of times. I uh, used to work not far from here at Nokia. I was there from 2001 till 2009. I was um, an analyst. Uh, I was actually asked to do uh, business analysis, not technical analysis, but I am an engineer by training. I have a bachelor's and master's as well in electrical and computer engineering from Tufts University. I also obtained a, um, an MBA from Harvard University in the mid-90s. And I've spent time before Nokia doing a few startups and working at large companies like uh, what is now called Verizon in the US and a bank called Chase, Chase Manhattan at the time. Um, so my background sort of straddles technology and, uh, and business analysis. And so I try to bring a bit of, to audiences that are technical, I try to bring a bit of, of, of uh, analysis of finance uh, and, and business. And, and to business audience, I try to bring a bit of technology just to uh, keep myself in a comfort zone so they don't beat me up too much. Um, and, and so you might hear a little bit of, of uh, assuming you are mostly technology people here, uh, a little bit more on the, on the business side of things. Um, so what, what I look at, and just this to give you an idea, this is, this is a graph I have, for example, this is Google. And uh, this is a graph of their, s of their revenues. This is the m money they, they, they collect. Um, and you can see, uh, sorry about some of the quality in the bottom here, but it starts at Q307 and it goes until Q215. So it's very, uh, very much up to date. The last bar there representing uh, the, the quarter ending uh, middle of, the, of this year. And uh, you see how much the business grew since 2007. So this is obviously uh, an 11, sorry, uh, um, s uh, eight year period. Uh, but you see that the business grew from about uh, five, a little less than five uh, billion dollars to uh, somewhere about 15. So there's a more than tripling going on in, in terms of, of the business. And, and some of it is a little bit awkward, you know, Motorola being acquired there, you see the red. Uh, and then it disappeared off the off the off the list, and then but it still grew. The company's doing rather well. Um, the the green and blue areas represent the mostly search. I would say that's pretty much all search revenue, and the yellow is newer businesses, including uh, Google Play Store. Uh, I think that makes up the most of that yellow segment. So, but this is a, this is overall a pretty good story, and I think you know. Google has been rewarded with an increasing share price throughout this period. Um, and so you might argue this is a, this is a pretty good, st good, good uh, um, story of the internet. And right next to that is Microsoft. This is just on the same scale. You can see how during that same period, Microsoft did not enjoy nearly the same growth rate. And nevertheless, they grew and they also tended to uh, they added, for example, the gray bits there at the very end there, those are Nokia uh, revenues that were added after the acquisition. So you see something of a, of a less, less exciting story for Microsoft. These are, by the way, the red, the, the, the color areas used to be meaningful. They're not so meaningful anymore. They used to be the office and Windows businesses, but now they sort of changed their categories to be far less uh, obvious in terms of customer segments rather than product segments. But still, that's, that's the picture. So when you put them together, you kind of get this idea that Google is growing faster than Microsoft. And it, that keeps up, then, then they'll overtake Microsoft and, and probably be a bigger business on the, in terms of revenues. And if we were to scroll down, I'm just going to compare these these blue areas right down here are operating earnings. This is means that the, the, quote, profits of the business before you subtract 
uh, taxes and before you subtract um, some, some extra sort of uh, occasional expenses. Uh, and, and so this tends to be comparable in terms of profitability between companies. This is, how, this is how finance people like to do things. And so when you compare the top graphs to the bottom graphs, you get a sense of the, r the, uh, the margins, what they call the operating margin. So the margin is simply the percent of the bottom from the top. And here too, you see a fairly steady rise in Google, Google profits and then uh, a fairly steady uh, 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 constant level for, for um, for Microsoft, you'll notice a couple of weird things. Like here, you have a, a spot where profits just disappeared, and that was a write-off when A Quantiv, which is um, the an acquisition they did a few years earlier, was written off. And as a result, during that quarter, they had no profits, but they came back to normal. So it was it was strictly a one-off event. And this little dip here is what? Anybody know? This very last negative, ne negative number for the profits of Microsoft. That was the writing off of Nokia. So Nokia is finished. It's not only gone from, from, from the sen of a sense of being relevant, but it actually was written off completely so its market value is defined as zero right now. So this was a very kind of very sad moment for me because I had been at Nokia for so long, and this is such an important company uh, to Finland's history. And so one of the puzzles that I've struggled with throughout my life has been, what makes these things happen? What makes growth happen? What makes disruption happen? Because what we did see was actually a disruption. We saw a company that was prosperous turn to being absolutely worthless within about eight years. Prosperous to the point where it was actually considered a, co uh, a uh, uh, you know, p possibly a, a, th a threat to, to uh, European uh, uh, regulators. European regulators, I actually met with them, so they said, um, you know, you have too much market power. We may have to uh, disable some of that power by disallowing you from making acquisitions, for example. And, and that was happening around 2004. And 10 years later, uh, the company is, uh, is, is, is worth zero. And, and so what causes this? And when I was at business school, I, I struggled at business school with these types of questions because uh, companies I had been working for prior to then, I also saw in, in dire straits, going up and down and being unpredictable about, about their, their, uh, their uh, prospects. And also, you know, markets didn't know, weren't able to predict any of this because the share price is supposed to reflect the net present value of all the future cash flows of a business. And it would be high one day and low the next. And somehow markets, meaning millions of people voting millions of times a day with their own money, could not predict anything that was going to happen. So we're, li we li we're living in very difficult uh, times when you look at it from, from this point of view. Certainly good times here, apparently, with Google, uh, but then again, maybe that won't last. So let me zoom out a little bit and add another character to this story. So this is the culprit here. This is Apple. Uh, and this is Apple during, again, all of these are the same time frames, both horizontally and vertically. So we're looking at 2007 to 2015, 2007, 2015, 2007, 2015. And on the vertical axis, everything is also in chunks of tens of billions of dollars. So what you see again is a picture of uh, Apple's revenues and the amount that they grew over the same period of time. And of course, it's color coded according to the products that they report. This is all public information. And so the gray area is the iPhone and the blue area above it is the iPad. So th that's essentially all new businesses. Actually, so is the purple area that, that is representing the services business, which includes iTunes, for example, and, uh, and now you know, Apple Pay, music, and all that other stuff that doesn't fit as a hardware product. And so that, you know, and then the blue area is the Mac. Uh, the little green area there, or sorry, the red area was the iPod. Um, and the green area used to be software and became something else. It'd be, oh, sorry, it used to be accessories and it became other, which is yellow now. But anyway, this is, this is Apple's uh, history. And I want to just scroll down a little bit because it doesn't actually fit. 
Um, so this is, this is what happened in that same time frame that Google grew substantially by threefold. Um, Microsoft grew moderately by, by you know, 20, 30 percent. And Apple, I don't know how many times. I haven't actually counted how many, how many uh, lines we have here vertically. Of course, there's a lot of seasonality to Apple's business. You see the spike. What does that represent, right? Christmas. Uh, and then the, 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 the second point after Christmas is usually the second highest of the year, and that's Chinese New Year, and that's become more and more important uh, over the last few years um, and might even actually be as big as Christmas someday. But that's, that's what happened here with Apple, and, and you can see that. And again, through, through, the, through the lens of profitability, we can look and ask the question, does this, uh, does this translate into profits? And the answer is yes. The allocation of these profits is speculative. It's my interpretation of things based on margins, based on prices and things like that. We know the iPhone sells for $650 a piece, and yet it costs probably $200 to make. So it has a very high profit margin. So, so I allocated a lot of the operating profits to it. And so you get to see the gray area. And so the gray area, if you took all of that profit that was generated from the iPhone and sort of asked yourself, how much is that? Well, it's probably more profit than Google made. In fact, it's several orders uh, or several multiples of all of the blue area. So it's, it's, it's a hugely important business. It's a hugely profitable business. But the question again is, will it last? Is this something that we're seeing as a very short-term phenomenon? And I'd like to also continue that, that thinking, if I'm going to zoom out a little bit and bring another character into the story, because there's another hardware company that competed or was seen as competitive with Apple, and that's Samsung, which you see here is the fourth character. Um, colors as well are sort of trying to be comparable. The gray area in Samsung is their mobile phone business, which again, is gray here, and this is Nokia. Did you see the re remnants of Nokia in this graph, the little bits of gray there. Um, and then you see Motorola here, the little bits of, uh, of red there. But so that's, that's two mobile phone giants versus two older mo mobile phone giants that aren't giants anymore. And you just see how much more profit, well, firstly sales and then profit. But it's also important to observe things like the delta between these two profits. And this is why you may have heard that Apple captures something like 80 to 90 percent of the profits in the whole industry of mobile phone manufacturing and sales, and that Samsung actually gets everything that's left over. So between these two, we actually have about 100 percent of the profits in the industry. And so again, the question comes, look, what's going on here is that there's a bit of a decline happening in the Samsung trajectory here. It grew very rapidly, in fact, uh, possibly even more quickly during 2010 to 2012 than Apple grew. And there were many people who said, that's it, Apple's done, um, sell it off. And it did sell off in 2012 to the tune of 40 percent drop in market value in a, number, in a few months. But now Samsung is in the same predicament. It seems to be also floundering. Its share price has collapsed a lot. And now, in fact, profits from phones are actually smaller than the profits from a semiconductor division, which is this blue area here. Within one picture, we can see a lot of drama. We can see a lot of stories to be told here, right? We can see margin stories. We can see market share stories. And I have one more character, which isn't sort of all that uh, interesting, but it might be. This is Amazon. And this is Amazon's uh, growth path. It's actually slightly better than linear growth. Um, you see, in terms of services and products and services, it sort of includes AWS, which is means that Amazon isn't just selling books anymore, not even selling goods anymore. It's actually selling services. And then you see that growth. But sort of like, you know, for comic relief, we can see their profits here, which are zero. But that's not necessarily the truth either. Z that means that they're reinvesting everything. So they do have actually very good cash flow, which is a better indicator of success, actually. But some people are very focused on the fact that they don't report profits. So here we have a picture of a few companies. There's only five here. And you see a story from 2007, which I considered the city to be the epoch when, when, when uh, smartphones became essentially mainstream. Uh, they were certainly existed prior to 2007. We saw uh, Nokia en entered in 2001. Uh, BlackBerry entered around 2000. 
three, probably, depending on how you define their devices. And also we had companies like Palm, we had companies like, um, like uh, Microsoft with Windows Mobile before 2007. Nevertheless, that's uh, my definition of sort of the, 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 the modern era of, of smartphones, and this is the result. One way, by the way, to also observe the situation is that there was a time when, when I forgot to say this about um, Samsung, there was a time when Samsung was making more profits out of Galaxy sales than Google was making from all of its businesses. Which also is an interesting observation. I think I may have said this last time I was here, is that you know, at the time Google, uh, when I was there, uh, Samsung was all the rage, um, and they were really raking in more profit than, than Google was, which actually enabled them to be what they were, because they were just selling hardware running, uh, running uh, an operating system that they didn't make themselves. So it didn't look like it was playing out the way the PC market was, where Microsoft was capturing all the profits and spl actually splitting them with Intel, and nobody else made money in the PC business. So already there were sort of some real questions about how the, the smartphone market would be, um, uh, would be shaping up as an economic, in, uh, um, economic story. And so here we have a couple of examples of what's going on. Now, any questions? Feel free to just speak up and sort of refute everything I say. Yes, back there. Someone has to throw the... Here you go. All right, good one. All right. Okay. Uh, I'm noticing that most of the companies seem to peak periodically on certain quarters. Yeah, what yeah, yeah. causes this? Yes. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I may not have made that clear. That's Christmas. Okay. So both Amazon and Apple are very Christmas-oriented. So that's uh, the fourth quarter of the year. Um, that's not true. And that's a very important observation when you look at the fact that Samsung doesn't seem to observe, th you know, observe that phenomenon, uh, and, and it's not true also so much. I mean, here there might have been some season, it's called seasonality, there might have been some for Microsoft, but, but it's probably not even Christmas, it was something around, or it may have been, I don't know, if Xbox sales or something spiked during Christmas. But, but, but uh, this is much smoother. Um, it makes sense for Amazon because, of course, people would do, do gift giving around Christmas. All right. So, um, so now I, I wa started to think, so how do we make sense of this? So how do we make sense of uh, what, what I call the process of birth and death, um, of company fortunes, birth and death? Because it seems like it's so unpredictable and it's so traumatic. Why can't we just smooth thing out, things out? Some of these are, are, are certainly smoother than others. Um, by the way, one interesting thing that I, I kind of highlight to people and not everybody notices is that um, this company, this company, and this one here, Amazon, are more or less the dominant players in their industries, right? In terms of sales, they, they are holding market shares, something around uh, sixty percent, maybe higher, depending on the region. I think Google might be even eighty to ninety percent in Europe. Microsoft in the PC market had at some point ninety five percent market share, and Amazon has very few significant competitors. Of course, it competes with brick and mortar, but in the online sales it 's extremely uh, dominant and so I as a result, what you end up with is really three what are you might call monopolies here. And these three monopolies are, are actually given great rewards for that monopoly. Uh, forgive me here, I'm going to mute this thing. Um, the, um, the pr the when you have, when you have, um, when you have a monopoly, you, you're assumed to be less vulnerable. So actually, uh, Amazon has a very high PE ratio. Google has a high PE ratio. You know what a PE ratio is? It's the price to earnings. So when you take the price of the share divided by how much, uh, how much profit the company gets, it's a very big number. And so that means you're essentially expecting them to live a lot longer. That's true of Google, Microsoft, and actually Apple, as, as, as spectacular as that might look, is, is among the lowest in terms of PE ratios. Mm, Apple's PE ratio is around 12, and uh, uh, Google's is around 30. So it's, ha uh, it's, it's, it's half the value in that sense. Uh, and again, that's a reflection of vulnerability. So people are already judging Google to be more reliable than, than Apple. 
So let's look a little bit at, at, a, at longer histories, okay? Because I'd like to sort of think about can we learn from history? I always like to think that history is a, is a nice, nice indicator. This, this is uh, data showing um, the, the birth of the microcomputer industry. And this is from uh, 1977 until about 1995. This is the history of PCs. You may not see this so well, uh, but these are individually, you see companies like Commodore, um, Macintosh, Atari, Apple II, Next, and up here is the PC, which is the IBM PC, and you see some numbers for, for how many units shipped in the particular year. And you, it's on a log scale. They pay attention to that because this is, this is showing 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, all the way up to um, a, a, a hundred uh, uh, million. So that's, that's the top of the graph. And so... Um, when we look at the history of PCs, we see again the similar phenomenon where early companies were, were swamped and then eventually some made it all the way and became dominant. And that's true of PC here, uh, running uh, way faster than anybody else. And, and so up until about the early 2000s, and then we had the entry of companies like Nokia with smartphones, which normally are not considered PCs, but they came to be known as, as sort of computing alternatives. Here's, by the way, the Macintosh, here's the Blackberry. And so we had this phenomenon where in the late 2000s, we had another wave of new platforms emerging. So this is the early PC, and this is the early smartphone eras. And they look very similar. And, and so I, I tell this story as a, as a sort of an example of the speed with which new things start and then new things fail as well, right? So you have somewhat, you measured the, 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 uh, the periodicity of things with this type of graph. Uh, and so we see how, for example, when we looked at, at Nokia's Symbian platform, this is the, 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 we don't even have the last few years, but this is the when it peaked right here in 2010. And then we had, we have a precipitous decline. Um, and a similar story here, for example, for, oops, not Macintosh. Here's the iPod Touch, which, by the way, is a platform that's also sunsetting and it's coming down just as fast as it went up. Uh, we have, what else we have here? The, we, the iPad, curiously, it's also having its own peak moment there and, and it's in decline. Um, so let's see, what else can we show here in the graph? I think. I think if we looked at, at RIM and that there's the BlackBerry here and you see again this peak and decline, very similar to what we were seeing back here in terms of Commodore and, and other platforms that are long gone. So again, the question is, does this help us in analyzing the past and the present? Does this help us understand what, how much time does a platform have to live? Interesting data, right? Well, I want to show the same data, but on a different scale. This is on, on a on a on a linear scale, no more log. You'll see here in the in the on the axis. Why is this? So you see now it's no longer in on 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 a log scale. And so when you look at it this way, it looks very much different because there's no early phase at all. There's the data is like literally not visible. They're all here. Oops. Sorry, my, my, my um, stylus isn't that good. So when I, when I try to highlight these, you'll still see the same numbers here scrolling back and forth, but they just, they're just not big enough to show up relative to what is essentially the biggest story here in terms of number is the a Android, and this is Android numbers, and, and this is just an estimate, but they, they sold over two billion, uh, sorry, one billion units in 2014. And the reason I put it in two different graphs is because really some people say that history is repeating itself, but how can history be repeating itself when the orders of magnitude difference between the, p the old and the new? And the way I describe this is I, if I go back and ask myself, well, how did Microsoft establish this, this super, you know, as we, you know, as I said, this was the monopoly of the PC is that, you know, it, it, it peaked here, uh, about 350 million units, and, and yet, you know, it blew away everybody who was, who was at the early phase, but, but what did it take to get there? 
When you ask yourself the formative years of the, of the, I, of the, of the PC and, and Microsoft, it was because they combined the operating system, which allowed PCs to be commoditized, plus they combined the office suite, which allowed productivity applications to take off. When you put those two together, you realize that they really were selling to enterprises. They were not selling to individuals. So in that era, when it was necessary to get maximum penetration, they were doing it by selling to very powerful sort of central purchasing authorities. And so in, in fact, in the 1990s, it was, it was possible to gain the global dominance in technology by making 500 sales. And I say that because I think of the Fortune 500. The Fortune 500 dominated the US GDP, possibly a significant chunk of the global GDP, each of them had an IT department, each of them had an individual in that IT department who made choices about computers, and so all that Microsoft had to do is convince 500 individuals to buy its platforms, and therefore those 500 would then in, in, you know, uh, um, cause uh, every one of the suppliers and distributors of those companies' products and services to adopt the same standard. And you take those 500 plus one or two in the US government and you have yourself a monopoly. That's what it took back then. But if you ask the same question, what does it take for, for someone to be successful in, these, in this epoch? Well, let me put it this way. Um, Apple doesn't yet have 500 million um, iPhone users. They're pretty close, they're probably around 450 million. But at the time when their stock price fell by 40%, they clearly had hundreds of millions of users. And no one really believed that those hundreds of millions of users were, would guarantee the survival of that business. And so in, the, in about 2012, if you had on the magnitude of 500 million users, each of whom made the decision individually to uh, buy your product, your chances of survival are less than the company that in the 90s made 500 people decide to buy its products. And this is what's reflected here also. And this is the, this is the amazing story about both the, the speed of change, but also the magnitude that we're dealing with in today's world is that you have things falling apart in about five years and having hundreds of millions of customers. Indeed, even Nokia at its peak had hundreds of millions of customers. They're not enough to hold on. You cannot hold on to your, to your uh, uh, long-term survival on that basis. So what's really going on? It's not just having users. And indeed, um, arguably, Apple's users are more loyal than Nokia's, but Nevertheless, Wall Street doesn't believe that at this time. So let's go back and get more data. This is the, the number of smartphones that were added in the United States. Um, sorry about the dimness here. I don't know if we can do something about the lights a bit. But um, what we have here is uh, you know, these numbers showing uh, in the, on the scale of, of um, tens of thousands, I believe. But it's a steady growth in the number of users. And this is not the best graph. Let me move forward. And um, advance to the next ref, which is actually a better one. This is the number of smartphone users in the United States. And you can see here how it grew over that same time period. If you remember, oh, this is actually not 2007. This is from 2009. So in 2009, there were about 39 million uh, smartphone users in the United States. Uh, and today there are close to 200 million, 191 actually. But this, notice the steadiness about the whole curve. This is the, the, um, the other data set the, the here on this graph is non-smart users. So they, although the overall number grew a little bit, it's not that big a change. So we've had this kind of decline in the total of non-smart users and uh, a corresponding increase in the number of smartphone users. And so I was tracking this on a month-by-month -month basis from the very beginning. And I kept telling people that, look, this is very predictable. We're going to get to about 80, 90 percent penetration in the United States. And I can tell you when that's going to happen. This curve is very, very flat. Or I, I should say, this line is very straight. And, and so people still didn't, didn't quite believe it. They thought they would saturate, and we've heard saturation was happening here, and saturation was happening here, and saturation is still happening now. It hasn't saturated yet. There's still those non-smart users, which I believe will be converted to smartphones. And also, by the way, 
That's just the United States. If you go globally, the smartphone percentage is closer to 30 percent than, than, than uh, uh, and this is closer to 80 percent. And the reason I bring this up is actually because I'm searching for predictability. This seems to be highly predictable. So why is it that if we can predict smartphone market and we can predict a decade in advance what's happening, why can't we predict the fortunes of companies that are actually serving this market? And part of it is, again, is this flipping of fortunes. Here, for example, here's Android, which we know has grown rapidly. And here's Apple, which also has grown rapidly. And then we have the other players here, like BlackBerry, which has actually declined over that time frame. So when you look at the total number of smartphones that are w making up the total here, you see that there's two players that are capturing all, almost all the volumes, whereas before, even as early as 2009, it was really a split between, uh, and by the way, uh, Microsoft is here and there, as I think about the red line there. Um, so it was BlackBerry mostly, uh, actually the number one market share in 2009. No, as you can see, uh, the top of this is 240 million. So the U.S. population is about 300. 40, 50 million maybe. And the reason this, this is limited like this is that this is only people who have phones, number one. Number two, it's only people who are above the age of 13 and aren't in jail. So there's a lot of people in jail in the United States. Uh, but, uh, but, but there's also children. So, so that's why this isn't a complete picture of the population, but it's a very good proxy of it. Um, and also, I believe that this is Comscore data. They also don't count businesses that issue the phone to. So these are individual consumer only. I'm sorry, is the data from operators? No, the data is from Comscore, which is a company that surveys 30,000 people as a sample and obtains this data. Uh, I'd like to be able to get it from operators, but they usually don't share. Uh, details like this. I mean, this is we're, we're getting a, a resolution on a monthly basis, also, and these are um, phone platforms. So, um, so let's see if we can. Uh, if you look at the same data as, as a line graph, uh, and this is this is what it would look like. This is the non-smart, the decline in non-smarts. Uh, this is the um, this is Apple, 84 million users now. This is Android. 98 million users, and so um, Android is above Apple, but not by much, surprisingly. And also, it looks like surprisingly, Android has flattened out a little bit in the last few few quarters there, um, and that's partly due to the iPhone 6 launch in the United States. And then you have these poor guys down here, which is completely like five Microsoft is only 5.6 million users in the U.S., which is really sad, um, and BlackBerry down to to you know single digits. Um, and so that's the story uh, on the line graph, and let me see if I can move forward here. Let's remove the, the non-smart altogether and sort of focus only on the smart players, and you can see this behavior as well. Sort of very parallel lines in terms of Apple and, 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 and Android, uh, except maybe if you look at the gap, the look at the gap here in January of this year, and then look at the gap now, uh, it's, it's kind of shrunk a little bit, right? So uh, Apple gained, looks like about, 10 million users in the time that, that, you know, Android only grew about, you know, three or four million. So there's, a, there's something going on there, but we may see that pattern repeat itself uh, um, uh, as, 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 as new products are launched. And here it is so seen as a, as, a, as, a, as a pie chart, as sort of a percentage of total. You can see kind of how, how um, the squeeze happened in the middle where Apple went to 44% of users, Android went to 51% of users, and it seems like it's a tie right now where they're holding on to these shares. They're not really swapping much, much market between them. Uh, there's a little bit of growth again with, 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 with Apple. And again, if, you, if we, we took away the, the, the non-smart, this is what it looks like there. I think we've seen that before. Now, what I want to focus on, though, is that this is actually not a linear thing. And this is where, where in the past, um, you can get caught in the, in the trap. Because all that looked like it was a linear market, but we know that, in fact, markets 
uh, diffuse, their, the technology diffuses in something closer to an S-curve. And the, r the reason we know it's an S-curve, by the way, even historically, we don't have this red data. This is, this is uh, 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 estimated. But we do have some points about the early times of the smartphone. So, for example, the, the BlackBerry was a 2% very early on in its in around, around that point in 2002. And so we assume that this is how it grew up until we started collecting the data, and then th we assume that this is what's going to happen afterwards. So things tend to occur in a nonlinear fashion, actually. And there's a, there's a function that governs this that's well known. It was, uh, it was actually observed in, in biology, it was observed in sociology, it was observed in many other... Uh, uh, it's even used in, 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 in the physical sciences. And so th th this is, this is, uh, this is the, the behavior which actually can be modeled. Um, and so if we, if, we look at, uh, if we look at that data uh, in terms of diffusion curves, we can actually see this is a transformation of it, by the way, in some so-called logistic curve, which allows us, if I actually turn it a little bit now, try this. If I look at it this way, you can see how those curves look like if you took penetration data and divided it by one minus penetration data, and it allows us to see S-curves as lines. And this is, this is roughly what the market looks like. Um, I'm probably not, not worth diving too, too deeply into this, but we're seeing essentially the b behavior of the platforms on a different, uh, on a different transform. And then there's a, uh, there's a curve fit that we can do here in terms of a market forecast. And that's what it is, and this is what actually is happening. And so this is a way for us to analyze this, this, this curve. Um, and so if I were to model and synthesize this market, I would develop an S-curve that looks like this for the United States. And so this is 2014, and now I can actually, using this, this synthetic model, go back in time all the way and get a very precise, sort of a very smooth graph of the history of, of smartphones. So the history of smartphones would roughly start, although it's, it's asymptotic, it would s roughly start in, the, in 2000 or so. Now what I want to do is, is compare that to other technologies that occurred in history. And here's the thing, you're going to see a lot of these data points coming by you here. I actually collected over 100 uh, diffusion curves for different technologies to compare them to the smartphone. So here, for example, is the internet. This is how quickly that grew in the United States. All of this, by the way, is bounded in the United States. So I'm, I'm struggling to sort of understand whether the smartphone is particularly fast or particularly slow. And yeah, we're, s we're seeing this phenomenon, uh, again, about times and, 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 and frequencies, but is, is it particularly fast or is it particularly slow? And so when I looked at this over time, for example, here's, um, here's how fast HDTV grew, which started in around the same slightly uh, around the same time. It also adopted very rapidly. It looks very parallel to that. Um, but there's all kinds of things. Have you ever heard of fracking? Sure, this is the way of getting oil out of the ground that has caused Russia all that trouble with the price of oil. This is how fast that grew in the United States. We can get obtain data about the growth of a lot of technologies. Um, for example, this is the MP3 player. But we can also go back, so for example, retail cards, ex uh, used, uh, so retail sites accepting credit cards, we can go back all the way to the 1950s, uh, and, and for example, debit cards was another thing. Video game consoles, strangely slow business. Uh, radial tires in automobiles. I'm picking these at completely at random because I'm just scrolling through and, and, and jumping around here. Electric arc furnace, which is uh, a process. But you see we're running out of room because this begins in 1977, right? That was when the PC era began. So let me try to um, move to, um, to a different view of this, which is let's zoom out a little bit. So there's our smartphone, but I'm going to zoom the scale way back. In fact, I'll show you that it begins here in the year 1900. And so now the same diffusion curves, if I scroll all the way back to 1900, and let's see what we can see here. Let's bring it all the way to, to the present, and I'm going to scrub through to the beginning. And in fact, here's some interesting technologies. The very first one is canals, which are a transportation technology. Here's newspapers, steamships, 
um, railroads, telegrams, electrification, lots of electrification, film camera. I don't know if you can, you can probably can't see this, but it's the film camera began around 1900 in the United States, and um, and this is how fast it grew back then. Let's see what else. Oh, we can't see them. It's unfortunate that I can't even show you this with clarity here. But this is the speed, uh, all of these diffusion curves, and uh, how fast they went. It's a lot of data. And I started to collect this because I became really interested in recognizing patterns among it. And so here's the list of all those technologies that I was able to obtain data for the United States. And it goes all the way actually back to 1820, which is the birth of the Industrial Revolution. And so we're looking at transportation technologies in the 19th century, we're looking at consumer goods in the 20th century, we're looking at industrial processes, we're looking at, at um, uh, communications, transportation, uh, washing machine, refrigerators, diesel locomotives, pollution controls, paper manufacturing, which actually is also uh, an important uh, sector here in, the, in Finland, credit cards, color TV, you name it. I love some of this old stuff, like um, hospitals. Hospitals have a diffusion curve. Primary school education, just going to school. There was a time when people didn't, there was a time when everybody did. So how quickly did people change from not going to school to going to school? How quickly did hospitals become something that everybody had access to? Or how about getting mail? How about, how about uh, uh, you know, the, the, the not just, you know, technologies, but uh, all kinds of other behaviors? And so when I looked at all these, this is actually 98 uh, graphed here, I also started to look at the future. Notice these are the ones with asterisks next to them. And these are the fusions that are, haven't happened yet. And by that, I, don't, I mean they actually literally haven't reached 10%. But there are things that a lot of people are interested in, so they're always asking these questions of how fast will this go? So how fast will wearable computers like smartphones and, and, and wearable in glasses and so on, how long will that take? Wind farming, using windmills, how long will that take to diffuse in the sense that we'll be using them more than we're using other forms of, uh, of uh, fossil fuels? Or how about storing energy, both in the grid and at home? You've heard of Tesla launching a, a home battery. How long will that take to be in every home? That's an important question, right? Uh, how about 3D printing? That's, that's exciting, right? It's consumer product today, but will it re reach industry? Fuel cell car, hybrid car, electric car, and autonomous car, four different forms of transportation, right, in terms of technology uh, uh, for the car. And finally, cryptocurrencies and photovoltaic power. Cryptocurrencies is Bitcoin, photovoltaics, obviously, uh, is solar cells. How long will that take, if at all, we'll reach the saturation that we're looking at? A couple of points, and I'm sure you're asking this. Uh, there is a selection bias. All of these are winners in a sense, except that we don't know for sure on the speculative ones. But everything else did reach saturation. So we're looking at the fusions that actually reached a, s a level of success. And, and, the, and, the, and there are hundreds and thousands possibly of things that didn't make it all the way. Can you think of any? I can. I can tell you, for example, that the pager didn't make it to 100%. I can tell you that the... Um, camcorder, there's one right there, but that did not make it to every household. It just stopped growing at some point. In fact, even the MP3 player, although I show it sort of saturating at 90, actually it didn't make it all that way, all the whole way. Um, and so there are, several of, uh, there are several questions as to why we're looking only at success stories, but possibly we'll, we'll, we'll solve that. Any, any other question while, while we're here? I'm going to make sure. Okay, so Here's what that data looks like. This is the raw data. You saw me plot the smartphone data in a sort of methodical way every single, every single month. This is what it looks like when you zoom in and you look at all those diffusion curves. And it's not a pretty thing, right? I mean, you saw them as beautiful curves, but the raw data looks like this because it's, it comes in and it's, it's messy and it's, it's, it's sparse. Sparse is the worst thing. You just don't have a yearly, uh, yearly cycle. But, but once you start to figure out, and, and for example, the way you do it is you do curve fitting. You look at the data and you apply an algorithm that matches a, a, an S-curve to it, and you get a good approximation. So that's how I came up with that hugely beautiful 
or, or rather you could so see me scrub through all of those um, lines. So let me see if I'm advancing here. Sorry, I'm pushing the iPad to its limits here. Uh, so here's that, that story. Again, beautiful graph. There's actually, all this is being rendered in real time. I'm going to try to make it more visible. Here's the dishwasher. So here are all those diffusion curves all together. And rather than me scrubbing through them, let's see if we can see patterns in this. And there's some interesting ones. For example, there's a lot of clustering of, of sort of th uh, thick lines uh, or overlapping lines here in the 19... This is actually the 1920s. You see sort of another cluster here in the 1960s. And then we see these clusters here in the modern times. And th I'll tell you what they represent. This is the electrification of industries in the United States. This is automotive technologies. And then we have several, obviously, digital technologies coming in later. And so already we can see some patterns. But how do we make better sense of this? How do we statistically analyze this so that we can get a better handle on causality, if there is any? And so what I proposed to do was to measure these curves in, uh, in a subset of their, of their entire length. So that idea was that when you have an S-curve, that it has several interesting points. Obviously, usually in the middle, you have a point where you have about 50% penetration. And that's an inflection point that usually goes from acceleration to deceleration. So that's an obvious one. You might also have a starting point. Almost every technology has a, 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 a point where I call market zero, when the actual first instance of a sale occurred of that technology. And don't forget, this is not when it was invented. The invention point could be anywhere, right? Sometimes an invention occurs de decades before actual market creation. And so th that is the point of invention. So invention to market zero, and then there's another point I arbitrarily called market 10, which is when we had the takeoff. This market 10, by the way, is what every VC cares about. Whenever you hear the word hockey stick, it's about this point right here. It's when you are going essentially from waiting to making money. And throughout this period between market 10 and what I consider saturation, which is 90, this is the zone of attractive profits right here. The zone, the zone when the most money is made. Actually, there's actually also money made here, but it's a different kind of money. This money made, this is usually public markets because the company goes public here, and this is private in the form of VC money. So VCs like to invest not here, they like to invest here, they want to be able as close as possible to get to here. Once they go to here, the IPO, they sell it to another bunch of owners, which are the public. And after this point here, you go back to private, which is in the form of private equity and money that's made by milking something that's mature. So actually, if you follow capital, it follows almost all of these curves in exactly the same way. There's certain kinds of money that is attracted to this opportunity. And obviously, there's a certain type of person as well, because you're going to have usually young entrepreneurs in this phase, you have mature managers in this phase, and then you essentially have caretakers in this phase. So there's a lot of things that you can, when you think about technology, you say, hang on, like for example, if you are really ambitious, you might not consider washing machines to be an interesting area for you to sort of dive into today, because it's saturated. All the things which are really old are saturated. In fact, they're probably obsolete, they're gone. The telegraph, gone canals no longer in use, right? Automobiles, especially internal combustion, way past their, their due date. And so clearly something is going on. There's a window of opportunity that's implicit in this data. And so if you're a business, if you were to t plot on these graphs, every single one of them is a technology. It's not a business, it's a technology, but the technology created an industry. An industry had a set of competitors, as you saw for the smartphones. We had something called the, the uh, smartphone, but in within it you had platforms. Within the platforms you had actual companies that were being born and dying within a very short period of time. So imagine that multiplied by all of these. 
So you had a, a drama around the car industry, and again, you had creation of car companies, then you had destruction of car companies, and then you had saturation, and then you had decline of car companies. And so we're, we're seeing this either stretched in a century or sometimes compressed in a matter of single-digit years. And so this is where I started to think about how do I even classify these technologies so that they allow, we, allow, we can see some pattern recognition. Sorry, my interface here. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Before, before I dive too much more, let me just point out that the time scales involved, these bars, these horizontal green bars overlaid on top of the diffusion curves are life expectancies. This is how long people are expected to live based on the year they were born. And so you're seeing the starting point. So for example, the way to read this is someone born here in the 1990s would, would be expected to live until, you know, 2070s, okay? That's just in the United States. And this is average between male and female. Obviously, there's people who are going to live uh, longer or, or, or not. But the point is that actually when you start to express you know, explore this data, you start to sort of be humbled by it because you're dealing with lifespans here. Lifespans of technologies overlaid on life uh, lifespans of people living in that time. And so it affected them dramatically. I spoke about this last time. It's a very good story. You can actually self-analyze. You can ask yourself, wha what's my life going to look like based on what's happening to, to the world of technology? And I think that's true whether you are a technology person or not. The technology is going to be the thing that de uh, determines much of our fate. But just keep in mind that we're dealing with, with people behind the scenes here and that this is, these are actually essentially a 300 year period. This is 1800, uh, sorry, 1900 until 2100. So I'm looking into the future a few years and I always say that I care about that because my son is going to live, even if I'm not going to live, all the way to the end of this scale and that my grandmother lived all the way to the beginning of the scale. So this isn't like some crazy amount of time. This is families, you know, spread of the families that, uh, you know, lifespan. So it's, it's people you know. So back to the data. So we have all of these curves. How do we classify? How do we categorize? How do we look for patterns? And so my thought was simple. Why don't we measure this period of economic value, this period right here, for all of those data sets? And so measuring that, that alone and then trying to see if there's any correlations. And so this is what those look like. Forget about the lines for a moment. Just imagine that I'm going to mark on one graph uh, uh, several dots. So for example, you see here the period. Invention, which I mentioned, and that's marked with a gray area. So imagine you have a, a bar graph going this way horizontally. So you have invention to market zero. And I call this the, uh, the commercialization period. And then you had another, another period between market zero. So here's market zero. Here's invention. This is commercialization. Market zero to market 10. And that's called market formation. And then market, market 10 to market 50. This is market expansion. Oh, sorry, 50, that's here. Expansion and then saturation. And then there's, un, 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 uh, I do not mark the area that follows, follows saturation. And it's color coded in a way sort of like you can imagine that sort of the gray area is not what I'm interested in, but the yellow and the red uh, I am interested in. And so when you look at those 90 technologies, this is what the yellow and the red are sort of the focal points here. So they're sorted by the point when markets are formed. So this is market 10. So I, I, I started sorting at this point in time when the market was formed. And so here you see them throughout, throughout history. Notice how the, the, the variability of the gray area, which is this formation period, which is very, very mysterious. Nobody knows why it takes so long from an invention until a market formation. And nobody really knows this period as well. Uh, it's beyond my scope to try to figure this out, but I am trying to figure out what makes things go fast between market 10 and market 90. To me, that's really interesting. And it's also, I think, the easiest problem to solve because we can try to measure a lot of things in that time. And so what I did is uh, plot the data on this type of graph. And it's a scatter plot. 
On the vertical axis, you see adoption rates, and this is the 10 to 90, right? This is this, this, this area here. So this is the, the length of that is, that is this vertical axis. And the horizontal axis is when this market 10 began, right? So what you're seeing is then old stuff is here. So this is when markets were created around the 1800s. So this is the birth of the Industrial Revolution. This is the 19th century U.S. Civil War. Here's the, the, the beginning of, of the uh, electric era, which is the, the, you know, Thomas Edison inventing things. Uh, and then we have electrification, and then we have the 20th century, and then we have the late 20th century, and finally we are here. This is uh, about 2014 is here, and then we have a little bit looking into the future. And on the vertical scale, colors represent speed in a way that sort of like I judge it to be fast or slow. So if green area is very fast, medium is a bit yellow, and then slow is red. And so what do we see just by putting this graph together? Is like, are things getting faster? Generally, they're more green in the recent years than there were in the old days. In fact, there were no greens at all in the very old years, uh, though there were some yellows. Uh, and then we have uh, a, few, a few reds, and then we have a sort of a mi mix in the middle. So if you squint hard enough, you could argue that things are getting faster. In fact, a lot of this data was, sp was, was prompted by an article that was written in the Atlantic magazine in the year 2000 that said uh, uh, consumption is increasing. And this was the celebrating the end of the 20th century and saying how much faster things are now than they used to be. And so I said, well, is the data prove that? And I was so excited, I thought, you, you know, there, there's a huge insight in that, that things are faster now than they ever were before. And that means we're heading towards a world when everything has happened very quickly. So how many times have you heard about singularity, about the idea that everything's going to be instantaneous? In fact, computers are going to get so good and so fast and so smart that they're going to take all our jobs and then kill us all. Um, it makes for great Hollywood movies, makes for great talk, on television and so on, but is it really happening? Is really technology always going to be faster and faster? And so a lot of it, again, depends on what you select to measure. And I, I'm open to getting all the data I can, but this is all I have so far. However, here's the weird thing. Is there's a lot of anomalies in this data. You can sort of measure that through R square, and you'd get a R square on this would be 0.22, which is really poor. But I don't want to dwell on you know, wh whose R score is better than whose, right? But it's, it's basically the point is that there's a lot of exceptions here. And we actually should study the exceptions, not the, the common, one, not what fits the, the, the trend, but rather what doesn't fit the trend. So you'll see several things that are actually very slow in the modern era. And this is the real problem here. A lot of these were those energy forecasts that we saw. We're seeing a lot of problems with not being able to adopt better energy solutions which are sort of obviously going to save our, our planet. So why is that? Why don't we want to do things that are good for us? At the same time, there are sort of some anomalies with some really old stuff that was going pretty quickly. And so they didn't have Moore's Law. They didn't have computers. How come they could grow quickly? And so I st you know, that's what I focused on is the anomalies, where I would look at something like you know, two technologies, one which was starting at the same time, but grew slowly versus one that grew s rather quickly at the same time. So the way to see that is within the same time slice, you see, you see somebody going quickly in the green zone and somebody right next to it going really slowly. And then I even observed that some of these which were st at the same point in time were actually enabled by the same core technology. So the classic example is refrigerator versus washing machine. So this is clothes washer versus refrigerator, both enabled by electric motors. Electric motors allowed both things to happen cheaply and s in small enough uh, so that they would fit in the home. And so this, these appliances, there was a boom of appliances in America in the, in the early part of the, or sort of mid-20th century. Um, and th th those trends uh, you know, spread globally pretty predictably. But wa washing machines are much slower than refrigerators. So I said, why is that? You know, at first I used to wave my hands and say, oh, it's because, w you know, people d need refrigerators much more because it saves a lot more problems in your life. You know, you don't have to go to the store as much. You, you know, you're, you're, you'll be sure that your kid is going to have milk and not get sick uh, um, and, and, and all these other things. That is what I, th I thought it was a health 
safety and, and, and labor-saving device, whereas washing machine, you could always wash by hand. But the fact that everybody had eventually adopted it, it sort of means that everybody had that problem to solve, just some people could wait. And so I couldn't quite answer that question as to why, just on the basis of functionality, why one thing goes faster than another. And so I propose a new hypothesis, and this is, this is, um, this is, uh, this is where, where the research is right now. Um, and so I thought that maybe, actually, it had to do, this, this washing machine gave me the, the clue. I said maybe it had to do with the fact that some things are easier to absorb than others. And so I, I thought about it and came up with a checklist of things that I thought would benefit a faster growing adoption. And I thought about it from the point of view of the consumer, the point of view of the person who has to buy this thing. And whether that consumer could be an individual or it could be an enterprise or it could be a business or it could be a government even. It's the adopter checklist. And the notion is conformability. How much does it conform to my life? How easy is it to absorb? And so these are the basic questions I ask. Is it, do you need to buy other things? Are there dependencies between these things? So this is called purchase independence. You could imagine like with a phone, you do you actually need a mobile network uh, to work with it, in which case you've got to deal with two things to buy, which is a hassle and slows you down. With these things, you've got to end up buying a, you know, a phone to make them work. And with you know, all of these other dependencies which slow things down, so people are more reluctant to buy them if they have to buy other things. Uh, the other thing is like, do I need to get somebody to help me? And this is a pretty obvious question, but actually it's a big slow, you know, really hinders things. Do I need to get somebody to help me install things? I, you know, uh, people weren't fast about adopting stereos because they had to put them together in their component systems and so on. Um, and this, by the way, is the washing machine. The washing machine, the, the explanation that this, this gives is that washing machine didn't fit into the home easily. If you go back at the time when these were taking off, these were t taking off in about 1920s. And in 1920, America did not have suburbs. America either was built on off, you know, in, 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 in terms of uh, farms, which were most people lived on farms, uh, and urban areas. And urban areas where apartments and farms typically didn't have electricity and didn't have uh, uh, plumbing, sufficient plumbing facilities. And so what happened with refrigeration, actually electricity came in about the same time, by the way. And so when, when electricity became, became available, people got, to the, got the, uh, uh, refrigerator very quickly, but the washing machine could wait because primarily they couldn't do the, the plumbing hookups. In, in apartments, you, you, you wouldn't need one uh, because you also could go to the laundromat and, and so that caused this, this, this slowing of adoption. Um, and so when you start to look at the histories of each of these things, you see little things that get in the way. And that's what this list is meant to capture. So for example, do you have space for the thing you're trying to get? Or does it save you space? Does it, can you get, get rid of stuff, especially if you have a house full of things? Do you save time or does it require you for you to use time? Does it absorb time? Uh, and finally, do you change your behavior? Do you have to learn something? So learning independence, time independence, space independence, help independence, and purchase independence. These were the things I wanted to put on the checklist. And then from the opposite side, so this is sort of the notion that you have a consumer pull. And so I call that conformability of the, of the, um, of the technology. And at this opposite side, we, say we have the question of how do you push the technology? And this is from the producer's point of view. And push, I call, I essentially I use the word of value, uh, value network or collaboration. And so this was the idea that you have combination of, of forces that are acting on the, on the, on the technology. So well, let's go through the checklist here. In terms of production, one of the things about Moore's law is that it says it's a law that allows you to produce a lot of transistors. And sort of, it's essentially encapsulating the whole idea of production. The car is the same story. When the car was, was able to gain traction, it was because the Model T was produced in the, on an assembly line. So you see definitely this idea of production as being the enabler. So what makes production and sales easy? Well, for one thing, it's the idea is that, can I get other people to help me? So the, 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 the value network idea is also essentially a one of collaboration. So people help you here, and you actually don't need help here. This is, there's this sort of 
th there's this symmetry here. In terms of collaboration, here's how you can look at these checklist items. Uh, the first one is ecosystems and content. So after I sell the thing, will someone make more products that sit on top of this thing that will make the customer buy more? And that's the idea of, I'm going to help you make money with my product. So there's this, this, this notion there about value above the product. And the network effect is that once people buy it, by using it and working together and sort of sharing information, are they able to make the product more valuable? So can the consumer actually act as a value generator in the network? Network effects, sometimes it's, it's, uh, 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 it's ca called Metcalfe's Law. Metcalfe's Law is, is that the value of the network goes up as the end log n of the nodes in the network. And that comes from telecommunications theory and way back. And, and sort of that drove essentially the phone system and then the internet and many other networks. But network effects actually are evident also in automobiles and other, other things that, that sort of once there are more of them on the road, there's actually benefits because you end up with service stations, you end up with, with uh, gasoline distribution that makes the, value, the product more, more usable. And so network effects are a, a, a very powerful phenomenon. So essentially getting the help of the customer to make your product more valuable. Distribution is simple, is the idea that you can get the the help of a salesperson to help you sell the product. So this is before it's sold. Can I get you to sell it for me and I'll give you a commission? And that's distribution power. And then supplier component architecture. This is more what we call classically modularities that, hey, help me build it by, I want to outsource some of the components that I don't want to make myself. And so we, when you see suppliers be becoming possible, then you, that may cause acceleration. And finally, can I leverage existing infrastructure and existing um, technologies that came before it? So imagine that this depends on electricity, and, and electricity depends on, on precursor technologies as well. So is there a lot of leverage in that sense that, you know, the, the 19th century didn't have a lot of things to leverage, whereas the 21st century is going to have a lot to leverage. The phone depends on microprocessors, it depends on open source software, it depends on mobile networks, it depends on the internet. All of those things themselves depend on other layers beneath them, and so on and so on. So it's a fractal process of sort of uh, leveraging and, and amplification. And so in that sense, if I were to put these checklists together, I would say, what makes things easy to buy and what makes things easy to sell? It's an economic idea. It has little to do with anything else. And when, you, when I did this, I said, okay, th let me just think about it as, as, as an entrepreneur would. If you're an entrepreneur and you're writing your business plan, this becomes your checklist. Is I want this to go as fast as possible. So I want to make it easy to buy and I want to make it easy to sell. I want to get people to partner with me and I want to get consumers not to have to buy anything else. And on and on it goes. So this is a very logical checklist for an entrepreneur and, and, and I would imagine this would make things go faster. So what happens in reality if we test this? So I had to go back in time. At that point when we had a 10% market, penetration for each of these technologies. So I'm asking the questions here, around this moment here, to be able to predict how quickly things will go. And so I gave a score, which, uh, which I call the modularity or interdependence index. One is the inverse of the other. Um, and so the idea is that you score these 10 things, a simple yes or no vote. Does this condition apply at this moment in time for those participants in the market? And when, when I scored it, and may, maybe I'm not the right historian to do this, I'm, I'm happy to get other people to give their opinion on this. This is what I got for the data. Now, what you can see is if this was highly correlated, and it, yeah, it is better than the pre previous one, but basically the way to read this is this, is that if you have a score of three in terms of interdependence, meaning that you actually scored seven yeses and three noes, that's what this means, um, you would have essentially a probable uh, rate of, the, of growth of 20 years. So, so that would be the m median of the, of the distribution of scores. But it would be 20 years plus or minus 15, so it's not a very good predictor. But it is certainly uh, 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 a clue. And so when you get into this, the, these technologies, for, for example, these have perfect scores, they score around five years. These are the fastest growing. And then the very slowest up here, you know, they have scores of nine, so there are very few yeses in those cases. And then they have uh, the, the, the maximum growth is just like 80 to 90 years. And is this a breakthrough? Now this is the question, right? Here's the data, 98 technologies scored on 10 different metrics, historic 
interpretation of what was happening and how does this help? Well, this remains to be debated, but I'm proposing this and I'm calling it essentially the modular revolution. The notion behind it is that when you combine these things together, what you're really seeing is the synthesis of the notion of modularity. The idea is that a problem can be divided and conquered more easily, and as a result, it'll go faster, it'll be accelerating faster. And so the question, therefore, is that I'm, I'm assuming that there's sort of like a variable M for modularity that is a function of speed, or rather S, speed is a function of M. And that's the, that's the hypothesis. M is an embodiment of two things, which is conformability and collaboration. Now, for this to be causal, that means nothing else is at work. And I can't make that statement. Notice in these, in these checklists, there are many things which are missing. There are many things like governments and pricing and regulation and, and serendipity and brilliance and individualism and all, all these other things that many people over the years attributed as the cause of speed, as the cause of invention. I'm actually stating right now that if you exclude all that, you get pretty good data. You get pretty good proof that things actually don't depend on that. But it's not conclusive. I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's very much subjective right now. So that's what I do. This is my research. Any questions? This is when we actually get interesting. Um, I think this is the best part is, what are your thoughts on this? What do you think causes things to go fast? The mic is right behind you. Uh, if you consider uh, before 1950s, there were no information highways to get a feedback for the product or something. So when you are considering the growth curves of the technologies before that, there's the difference that there were maybe feedbacks very locally or with the experience mm -hmm. or something. But when you come to 1950s and more than that, it's, it's more about the feedbacks because the, if you used, at first you saw sort about Google and it's earning its revenue from all the data analytics. Mm. Its revenue is around 70 billion mm -hmm. and the profit is around 15 billion, but it's all about data analytics mm -hmm. and it's all about the feedback. So when you are curving, you are tracing a curve or something, it should not be, I think it's more onto the feedbacks or the information that is present with the people mm. right now. So uh, there should not be a more correlation with the technologies, at least from, you can go yeah. for 1980s or something, and after that, that, that you cannot correlate them and uh, come out with a growth curve for the technologies that are coming right now. Well, that's what the data is trying to sort out. And so that's, you know, so what I th let me try to paraphrase that. You're saying the fact that we have access to a lot more information and we have communications of that information, it ought to lead to faster technologies. And I'm not listing here in my conditions anything about that. Now, the, the question though is, why doesn't that help in critical sectors of the economy today? So why doesn't that help in those speculative technologies like energy, transportation, healthcare, education reform, and government, which is actually the slowest of all? They all have data today. They all have the internet today. They all have data analytics today. They all have the highway network. They're not changing. They're so resistant to change, in fact, that many people have given up hope and say we will actually destroy the planet before we fix these problems. And so that, that is, I, I don't, I don't you know, disagree necessarily. I'm hoping that we have a magic there, uh, a solution there. But the problem is that I'm mostly concerned with why things today are slow rather than why they are fast. Does that make sense? Uh, I would say that uh, if, if you're talking for, a, I'll give an example, as that in, in the early 2000s, the services that were offered from the telecommunication providers were centralized. And uh, slowly we came up with smartphones. The services are also getting distributed mm -hmm. a bit more. Mm -hmm. So I would say that when you are talking about information highways or something and the feedbacks, the services that has to be uh, taken from the centralized infrastructure to the distribution.
distributed nodes, whatever may be. Suppose, for example, if you have about a washing machine. So the services where uh, we see efficiency or we say it's a good company when we see distributed services over the entire country or something. Similarly, when we talk about other services or the business you are talking about, the services have to be di distributed in the same manner. What is happening is uh, with Nokia or the same stuff is the services were not equally distributed along with the hardware products. So when as we slowly progress, I think more with the feedback, the services are mm -hmm. getting to be cleared by the people who understand what's the need mm -hmm. and how to distribute it. So that's the way also we are going for internet of things. It's like the democracy of the nodes mm -hmm. because they are taking a chunk of power and the, uh, mm -hmm. the protocols and something from every, from the centralized infrastructure. So that's the way the business grows because mm -hmm. uh, you cannot go for by the 1900 models because uh, that's, the not, that's not the thought process of the current people because uh, everybody wants services and th they don't want any centralized infrastructure behind it. That's, th that's creating a lot of uh, difference of time. So this, I think this is a different model to consider rather than uh, taking uh, models from the earlier mo uh, inventions. Well, point taken. I, 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 we have to study more possible conditions, but the, the methodology here is to take a condition and ask, did it, was it present also throughout time? And if you're saying, no, the world is completely different now than it was before, then we can't test across time. And, and, and it's, it's, it's a little bit unnerving because actually there were many things that happened very quickly. Let me just give you a couple examples. During the late 19th century, there were two technologies that grew extremely rapidly and surprised everybody. Uh, besides a newspaper, which actually was, was a phenomenon at the time that was really disruptive, uh, sewing machines and bicycles. I don't actually have the data, I have production data, but sewing machines and bicycles were actually extremely, extremely rapid growth. Uh, they created disruptions in their own right. I mean, people could suddenly manufacture things with sewing machines they couldn't before. They could also use them at home to fix things, save a lot of time, and so on. And they were not enabled by electricity. They were not enabled by, tech by any kind of uh, um, um, uh, electronics. Uh, bicycles were another interesting phenomenon because bicycles actually required some innovations in manufacturing to be produced in the scale they were and everybody wanted one. Everybody ended up getting a safety bicycle in the late uh, 1800s and actually it, it caused tinkers, people who were playing with bicycles, to look at other things like motorizing them and creating cars eventually and eventually also airplanes. So when you trace the innovation cycle back then, you realize that, you know, the tinkers and so on were, were, were enabled by these, by these inventions. So I don't want to exclude those types of technologies and ask what caused them to grow and why actually a 19th century sewing machine is more quickly adapted than a uh, twenty, uh, 21st century uh, uh, electric car. I think this is, this is the type of debate I'm interested in. But thanks for the feedback. Um, we had one my, more back my, here. My question in the, in the middle. What, uh, what are the data points on the left, bottom left side? Do you remember? Bottom, uh, you mean here? Yeah, what are these, you know, brilliant? Uh, oh, the very bottom ones. Yeah, um, or even the one layer up, uh, but uh, still, you know. Yeah, I, I, I wish I could have put these in the software so I could tap on them. Um, but uh, if I recall correctly, there are things like um, 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 tablet computers, uh, MP3 player was pretty fast. Um, I think one is the speculation that wearable computers will be very fast. Uh, I'd, I'd have to get another, uh, another tool running before I could exactly answer that. But, but, but effect, effect, eff effectively ICT related. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Very much so. What I, when you look at early stuff, like I mentioned, from the 19th century, it wouldn't quite fall this fast. I mean, it would be in the 20s here, like in the 20 year range, 20 to 30 year range, which is still, you know, uh, we wish we could get 20 year turn, turning of the, of the you know, photovoltaic energy, right? We wish we could get that, but best estimates right now are 70 years. Yeah. Uh, all these texts are like uh, people related. So, and the future, like Internet of Things, are, are used that you can't absolutely know how much it's going to be 100% because it's related to stuff and what you use. And 
So, so yeah, so uh, I think what you're asking is when you think about what is saturation, yeah. well, I'm going to give you an extreme example. What is the saturation of a new process of steel manufacturing? So I studied two or three kinds of steel manufacturing, the, the Bessemer process versus the mini mill process and so on. And, and what you're looking at there is the number of steel uh, plants that switch. But like, you know, n a nitrous oxide controls on, on, uh, uh, um, on, on, on power plants. Those are, again, the, the addressable market is the number of power plants and how quickly do they all switch over. And it turns out, actually, that when you look at, at uh, industrial processes or containerization, the changing of using, con uh, you know, cranes to lift uh, the goods from the ship and drop them on the dock, to you lifting a container and dropping it onto a truck, that shift occurred very rapidly. It, it occurred globally and it was just a phenomenon in the 60s and 70s. Uh, but again, what is the addressable market is the number of port facilities, of which there might be only a few dozen globally, that uh, switched from that model to, to containerization, right? So, so we, we might be looking in one case at, at a billion switching points and another case at, at, at 100. So there's definitely that, but yeah. Use same S curve. Yes, that's exactly yeah. the point. We're normalizing it to a population that converts, but the population all converts. That's the important thing: is how quickly. So, if I were to ask photovoltaic, I would measure percentage of energy that's that's currently derived from carbon versus renewable, right? And that would be for for the national scale, right? If we, by the way, this is also United States. I'd love to be able to do the same analysis in Europe, the same analysis in Asia, or even on the country level, if possible, to look for anomalies to s ask the question: Why does, for example, India have supermarkets that and Indonesia doesn't? And you ask this question, is a very fundamental one, like by the way, supermarkets are an innovation that's been tremendously disruptive to, to, to retail and to convenience and other, all these other things and transportation. And when you look at the United States and you ask, okay, here's the S-curve for, for uh, uh, supermarkets and it went from 1930 to 1955 and then it didn't, didn't go anywhere else. It was just the United States. So what did it take for supermarkets to take root in Europe and then what did it take for them to take root in emerging markets? And we have this phenomenon where it just was not happening in India, which is not happening. And then suddenly, and people were writing lots of papers as to explaining clearly why India will never have supermarkets. And then it just happened. And it, whoosh, it went just as fast as everywhere else. And so the, again, the question is, what caused this? First, what caused it to start and what caused it to go as quickly as it did? And that's, that's an, again, I think a puzzle that hasn't been solved, and I'm trying to see if I can attack it from these points of view, which, again, may not seem like I'm dealing with oranges and oranges here, but, but actually economists are very, very much doing this. So they're, they're looking at this, so. Yes. Yeah, so how much have you studied the failing technologies? How do you identify a sinking ship? Do you just use the checklist, but in reverse? Well, no, good question. The checklist is only really there if, if there are... So th there's another condition that pre precedes all the checklists. Is this, is this something that everybody wants? So what I'm checking is if everybody wants this, how quickly will they get it? Now, that's a very tough question. Actually, to get... First, there are many other tough questions. So we're, again, we're measuring here, assuming we get to here. But we don't know, for every invention, probably, well, for every million inventions, there probably is one market. For every market start, there's probably, or for, for every 100 market starts, there's probably one that gets to 10%. And for every 100 of these, there's probably only one that gets to this. So you have a huge amount of, of, of uh, uh, filtering going on already. Uh, you know, if you, if you want to measure this, by the way, the, the num instance of inventions is the number of patents filed. And if you look at it globally, and, and that number is con constantly growing every, every year, and, and, and some companies are filing tens of thousands of patents nowadays a year. Um, and then you have, by the way, there are many ideas which never make it to be inventions anyway. Those ideas could themselves create markets, Usually you want to protect it with a patent, but that's not always the case, right? So, so in terms of innovation, there are many ideas, 
inventions, creations, novelties, etc., etc., etc. All these things are, are always the product of, 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 of creative minds. But to get to this point, it means you've actually convinced everybody to use your product. Everybody who could use your product will use your product. And that is the, that is the crucial question. And so, again, the reason I study this is because actually we need to fix a few problems that we all have. And that's where we look at these big problems and you say, we actually need to flip a switch here. And why is it that we could flip it faster at some point in time and we can't flip it anymore? And, you know, if, even if we throw money at it, infinite money at it, we can't flip it. And so that's one of these things why, why I'm guiding these towards this kind of analysis, trying to see what history tells us. Yes? So as a solution, why not trying to attack this problem using some really good computer code in which we define a crazy large number of like customers uh, as members of a population and we define like the needs they might have they put them, we put them all in one graph and we start uh, changing parameters and see like in a like itr uh, iteration like going on. I, I we yeah. see how does this population react by changing a specific limitation or like. There I have, yeah, I've heard this before and I think it's, it's uh, you know, modeling this, this uh, systems are, is probably, has been tried in some instances. Um, I, I think, uh, before we even calibrate that, we need to sort of understand a little bit about how to do that, right? Uh, I'm not an expert in that area. I think there have been people who tried it. Uh, and certainly I'm, you know, happy to see, you know, what's go going on there. But I, I, at this point, I'm trying to analyze it as a historic, you know, actual data rather than simulation. But it, it's a very interesting idea. And one more thing. Uh, Mm, possibly it could be useful to define something like an inertia factor, uh, which really tells us about the, uh, the, the target customers, you know, uh, like, undesired, like non unwillingness to like get the product, buy the product or get right, the right, services. Right. There are sociologists have been looking at this and when, when the original S-curve was proposed as an adoption of technologies, uh, the man who did it, his name was Rogers in 1962, uh, he modeled it as uh, essentially a learning problem. So he looked at it as essentially some people are more early learners and some people are late learners. And the late learners learn from other people who give them that information. And so you have, the, you have this, this feedback loop that causes this, the, cur the curve. And actually, again, this is the, the formula is very much modeled on the feedback mechanism that exists in nature as well. So that's already been thought through. That's why he characterized the psychology of buyers as being so-called innovators, er, uh, uh, early adopters, uh, uh, late adopters, and so on. And that terminology is still in use today. And it defines, he defined these as basically being specific s statistical segments of a population based on their psychology. The problem is that, I mean, that doesn't help us in a lot of this where, where you know, th there are fairly few people and they all think the same way. And yet we still have, like, you know, governments and other people who don't, don't necessarily fit into a so sociological model. I apologize I'm already over at the time, so feel free to leave if you need to, but I'm here to absorb as much as you can give me so I can hang out longer if you have questions. Any other, other questions? Arguments even? No arguments? Well, I if you want to learn more, uh, you can follow me on, on, on uh, Twitter. I'm asymco, A-S-Y-M-C-O. Um, and um, I write a bunch about, about other things as well. But help, if you have any questions, send them into Twitter that way. Just, you know, message me there. Okay. Then let's thank our speaker and for the day. Thank you. Thank you.